All right, so on Wednesday, we had started chapter 18. So in chapter 17, right, we were kind of talking about um, genetic research in terms of, right, kind of mapping out genomes where we were like cutting up DNA and kind of marking things, kind of figuring out where stuff was, right, in this kind of general sense. And then in chapter 18, we get into actual like genomics. So kind of dealing more specifically with actual genome sequences, right? So we talked about sequencing, right? The kind of original Sanger sequencing, which was this kind of slow um, stepwise process. And then we got into next gen sequencing where we can kind of sequence loads and loads of DNA at once, right? To get the actual kind of like ultimate physical map, right? The actual code for a genome. Right, and so kind of at this point in chapter 18, it pivots a bit from going through these kind of like more technical, um, kind of nitty gritty mechanical stuff into like, what is all of this good for? What do we actually use all of this sequencing technology and all of these kinds of genome maps for? And so chapter 18, section three talks about a few genome projects um, that have happened. There are several, we just kind of, we're gonna go through a few examples um, just to see how this data that we can generate, right? We can generate like terabytes of data, but why bother? Because there are some things we can do with all that data. First one and kind of most famous is the Human Genome Project, right? Um, so this one started, it was initiated in like 1990, I think, and it was actually a really cool project. So it wasn't just like some single lab somewhere at some school doing this project. It was actually kind of it was multiple labs basically all over the globe working together to sequence the human genome, which kind of makes sense, right? Because if we're doing this Sanger sequencing and we're trying to get through like hundreds of thousands of millions of nucleotides, right? It just took a lot of like literal kind of like long day labor, right? So it's this kind of multinational collaboration. It took about 13 years, took billions of dollars, right, to do but it was completed in 2003 and we had at that point one single human genome, which doesn't sound like much now knowing what we can do. At the time it was a really big deal. And so what did we learn, right? From sequencing this dude's genome, right? So one thing that was discovered is that humans have fewer genes than we thought, right? Knowing, right, we knew a lot about kind of animal fizz, human fizz, how many enzymes we make, all the different proteins we make. and so the hypothesis was that we should find around 100,000 genes. But when they sequenced the genome, they only found about 20,000. And we, because of the things we've talked about, actually already know why this is. They did not at the time. But this diversity of function from these relatively few genes comes from that alternative splicing, right? The fact that eukaryotes have, you know, we have these 20,000 genes, but we can take each one and kind of like mix and match it around and use each gene to make several different things, right? And so you come to this conclusion that the complexity of an organism, right? Because we like to kind of view ourselves as being particularly complex and fancy, right? But it is not necessarily related to the number of genes or even the size of the genome. There are organisms with a lot more genes than us. There are organisms with have much, which have much larger gene or genomes than we do. Um, one of the things we're running into, this is kind of, so this graph, what this graph is showing, right? So on this, so this y-axis is just the number of genes present, right? So humans were in the kind of 20,000 range. We're kind of here-ish. And then this is the size of the genome in millions of base pairs. So we've got prokaryotes are the little blue circles and they're kind of down here, bottom left, which is where you would expect, right? They've got one little chromosome. They don't have a lot of genes. The genome's not very big. So they don't have many genes and their genome is pretty small, small still being a million base pairs long, right? So it's still kind of, it's a lot in a sense. But as you go through, right? And humans are over here and we have one of the largest genomes that's been sequenced. The thing is once genomes get bigger than this, we're still kind of computationally learning to deal with things that large. So there are probably organisms further this way, but we certainly don't have the most genes. Mice have more genes than we do. Rice has more genes than we do. Freaking watercress has more genes than we do, right? So the number of genes does not necessarily have anything to do, not to not cress or anything, but doesn't necessarily have anything to do with how complex some living thing is, right? 
It just has to do kind of basically kind of with the evolutionary history of some organism, how many genes they've ended up with, right? And then how they use them is kind of another facet to that. So that's kind of what we learned from the Human Genome Project. And so we're like, well, we've sequenced the human genome. What's another useful thing we could sequence? And so um, a project that kind of came along afterwards was the Wheat Genome Project. Not as successful, but with the best of intentions, right? Wheat feeds like a third of the planet, right? It's a major component of the diet of a lot of people on earth. And we're dealing with climate change. We're dealing with droughts and water loss and growing populations, increased disease, urban is all of this kind of stuff, right? And so if we could sequence the wheat genome, right? Learn about it, learn kind of how it works at, you know, its most basic level, right? We could potentially work with wheat to increase its yield, to make it drought tolerant, to make it disease tolerant, right? Do all of these things we do with other crops like corn and rice and stuff like that, right? And so there's potentially a lot of benefits in sequencing the wheat genome. Unfortunately, when we tried to, we discovered, here's a great word, that the wheat genome is allohexaploid. The heck? So we're diploid, right? We're that far. We've got two copies of all of our chromosomes. We are diploid. Hexa means six, right? Plants are plants do the most bizarre things. This plant is hexaploid, meaning it has six copies of each of its chromosome. Specifically, let's make it more weird. It's allohexaploid because all of these copies are actually not just the result of inheriting kind of in a straight species sort of line, but actually the result of hybridizing with other species, right? So basically what happened, so here are, so we've got these three ancestors that have all kind of combined their genomes to give us wheat, right? The stuff we make like flour from, right? So we've got ancestor A and here is its genome, totally normal, seven chromosomes, two copies of each, regular little plant, but it hybridizes with this second plant who also very normally has seven chromosomes, two copies of each, but they hybridize and the plant, the offspring are like, cool, we'll keep two full sets. We're gonna keep four copies of each of two chromosomes, each pair of each of the chromosomes coming from two different species of plant. And then later on this hybridized allo quadruploid plant hybridized with another other plant and we're just like cool we'll just pick up a third genome why not and so at the end of this party you have now wheat that we grow and it basically right it's got three pairs of each chromosome so like for chromosome one it functionally right because these plants are hybridizing they're not that different in one sense it's basically got six copies of every chromosome, except for they kind of pair up, right? These two are gonna be more similar than these two and these two, right? So basically the genome's a hot mess. End of story, genome is a hot mess. So you've got 21 chromosomes, seven from each ancestor and double copies, 5.5 billion base pairs, billion base pairs. How do you even deal with that? I don't care what kind of computer you have, right? And so we have two big problems here. One, that's huge, right? Like, that's just huge. And because we kind of, in a sense, have six copies of each chromosome, right? We talked about next generation sequencing, which is how we do this. You chop up all the DNA, you throw it into the sequencer, it gives you like, good, God, trillions of reads at this point. I don't even know what this data would look like. Insanity, um, right? But I've chopped it all up, which means like those six copies that should each be separate chromosomes are now just all chopped up in a pile. How on earth are you going to put that back together, right? So you've got these large amounts of highly repetitive DNA, right? That would each kind of supposedly, if you were sequencing this genome, get all separated out somehow. I don't know how right? It's, it's a puzzle that's all sky. Like computationally, this is just ridiculous, right? And this kind of plays back to that finding from the human genome project, right? I don't, I mean, wheat's great. I love bread, but like you don't really think about it as a super complicated thing, right? But the human genome was way easier to sequence, way smaller, right? So, so wheat genome, 
And actually, this is kind of the same problem we have with spider genomes. We don't have a spider reference genome because they've gone through multiple genome duplications. They didn't even hybridize. They're just like, I'm just going to make two of them and make it hard, right? So genetics can get really complicated depending on the organism you're looking at. All right, well, let's leave wheat then. Let's try something a little closer to home. Cancer genome project. Great, great idea. Cancer is bad. Blah. Right? So cancer, right, is a huge medical issue, kills thousands of people, around 1,500 people a day just in the U.S., right? And we've talked about cancer before, right? We talked about mitosis. We talked about cell division regulation, and we know there are genes that cause cancer. So we have a human genome. If we can look at genomes of tumor cells, which we know have mutations that lead to cancer, we can start mapping the specific changes or specific causes of various kinds of cancer. That's good, right? So they did that compared all these different kinds of tumor cells to corresponding normal cells to figure out kind of mechanically what's going wrong, right? And we identified over 200 genes, right, as potential drivers of developing cancer, right? To include the ones we discussed, right? Rolling it all the way back to like, geez, like three exams ago, oncogenes and tumor suppressor genes, right? Are in this group of stuff that we found in this project right? Which is great. We can find these genes. We can identify predictors. You can get screened to see if you're likely to develop, to develop certain kinds of cancers. We can look at how they work at the most kind of basic mechanical level. We can predict how cancers are going to progress, how quickly, what's going to happen, right? And then we can kind of anticipate a person's responsiveness to treatment, right? Given what kind of mutation is happening, how those cells are going to behave, the different kind of treatments we have, right? You can make these very kind of specific medical decisions based on exactly what is happening in a person's body. So the potential here, right, to, to basically to cure cancer or to prevent it or to kind of head it off in a sense or to treat it in the most effective way possible, right, kind of becomes, well, becomes a possibility, right? So we have the Cancer Genome Project. All right. The Thousand Genomes Project. So this takes a bit this is another kind of human genome related thing, but we have, there's actually, I think the Smithsonian is doing, I think it's like the Million Genomes Project. These, these things just keep spinning off all over the place. But the Thousand Genomes Project specifically is looking at human genetic diversity, right? So we did our crazy human genome project. We, did, we sequenced a human genome, right? We can do it a lot quicker now, so that's nice. Um, but that 13 year, $2.7 billion project only gave us one genome, one dude from wherever he was from, right? One single individual. I mean, which is cool. Now we have a reference genome that's handy. But the Thousand Genomes Project came in as like, well, we can sequence a genome in a couple of days. So let's get DNA samples from like a thousand people all over the planet, sequence them up, and then we can really start learning things about genetic diversity in humans and all this kind of stuff, right? So they took samples or they, they got people to kind of donate DNA samples from over a thousand people from 26 populations kind of all over kind of worldwide. They identified 80 million genetic variants kind of in comparing all of these genomes, right? And found that the average genome, just kind of of all the DNA they sequenced, differs from the reference. So this individual at around 4 million sites. So 4 million like little nucleotide bases in the millions and millions of nucleotides, right? And so they were able then again, because we've got, we've got good computers now, right, to take all of these over a thousand genomes together in a single analysis, comparing these billions and billions of base pair sequences, right, and then kind of look at how kind of all humans on the globe are related and figured out that we were a single population of organisms, right, around 200,000 years ago, which is pretty incredible, really, I think. All right. So cool, we can sequence a lot of stuff, right? And sometimes it's easy to see how it's useful, but we kind of have to take it a bit of a step further. So this next section talks about annotating DNA and then basically creating all these databases, right? Because we are producing so much data so fast at this point. All right, so cool, we can sequence a genome, right? I can collect a specimen and have a genome by the end of the week in some cases. But a genome just in and of itself, right, just a big pile of data, this long string of letters isn't inherently useful, right? So 
it becomes, I mean, we can compare things, but it becomes inherently more useful if I can go into that DNA and annotate it, right? Kind of talk about its functions and how it's structured, right? Just kind of you talk about the same way you talk about like literary annotation, right? You can go through a DNA sequence, right? And you can find genes, you can mark them, right? And just create a much more informative piece of data, right? Okay, so this field, which is like this huge and growing field is called bioinformatics. So this is where kind of biology meets computer science. And there's actually kind of a lot of computer science people who get kind of roped back around into biology because most of us biology people aren't super computational or coding inclined. I do my best, but it's not my strong suit, right? And we will literally just hire computer people to do this for us. A friend of mine just got hired as a bioinformaticist at a, at a university. It's a job. And so basically this is just using computer programs to go through these huge piles of data to search for genes, to kind of indicate structure and assemble, right? All of these massive piles of sequence data that we get from various organisms, right? So we've got this bioinformatics field. It's kind of grown up in the last probably decade really. So one tool that bioinformaticists and anybody, because this is available to anybody, can use, right, is this NCBI database. So the NCBI database holds a lot of sequence data. So the thing is, so say in my lab or in any lab, you take a sample, right, you sequence some DNA, you use it, you publish your paper, you then take, right, the expectation in the scientific community is that you then take your data, all of your sequence data, and you put it onto a publicly available database so then that anybody else doing research can see your data and use it in their own research. Now, one of those databases is NCBI and they have this algorithm called BLAST. And so what BLAST does is say I sequence something and I have this piece of DNA sequence. I don't know what it is. I don't know what it's for. I can plug it into BLAST and that algorithm will return to me all of the annotated genes that match my sequence. Right, so I can like upload a piece of sequence I got out of a spider and they're like, that looks like sequence that codes for DNA polymerase, that codes for CO1, that codes for right anything that you might have a gene for, right? And you can do this. And so you can search, you can blast sequences, but you can also just search for animals, right? You can go to the NCBI webpage, type in like house cat or something, and it will like pull up a whole bunch of cat DNA sequences. You don't even have to go into a lab now to do DNA research. You can just pull these sequences down. You can download them, run your own analyses, do your own thing, right? Without ever actually extracting DNA from anything, which is also kind of bananas. Okay, so, so I've got some DNA. I want to annotate my DNA. The first thing I have to do is figure out what is coding and non-coding though, right? Because if I'm looking for genes, the non-coding bits are not useful to me, right? So I'm not, I'm not gonna worry about those. But I can't look up a gene. There's nothing I can put into, say the NCBI database, if I don't know where the genes in my sequence are. So how would I know where a gene is starting in my DNA? You absolutely would, right? You'd look for a start codon. Yeah, absolutely, right? You can use the same thing your cells use to figure out where a gene starts, right? You just look for a start codon. It's universal across all organisms. So you can just literally like control F, AUG, or whatever, find it. Okay, so then where does the gene stop? Fantastic, add a stop codon, right? And that's it, like you just have this long DNA sequence, you search for a start codon, somewhere downstream of that is a stop codon. Cool, I've found a gene in my DNA, I can pull that out, I can search it, I can figure out what it is, I can add that annotation back into my DNA sequences, right? Now, I find the start and stop codon, right? So there's a gene in between it, right, that would be transcribed from this start to this stop. And so this region is my open reading frame. Remember reading frames are where, here's my start codon, so now I'm gonna start reading codons. And that's my reading frame. So this is my open reading frame from my start to my stop codon. 
And so it is a region that holds a gene. Okie dokie. So our genome, any organism's genome, consists of coding DNA and non-coding DNA. We've kind of talked about this. We've mentioned it kind of in passing, right? So there's kind of organization to the genome, right? You've got all of this DNA, but not all of it is used to make proteins, right? Some of it's doing other stuff. So we've got coding DNA, which contains genes, right? Which encode proteins. And then we've got non-coding DNA that doesn't. Why on, why? Why on earth do we have non-coding DNA? Well, for lots of reasons, which we will get to. So, but how much? How much non-coding DNA? In a eukaryote, your cell has about six feet of DNA. So like if I took DNA out of a single cell in my body and stretched it out, it would be taller than me. I'm not particularly tall, right? Only one inch of that codes for genes. What? It doesn't even make sense. 99% of your DNA is non-coding. Previously, we just kind of referred to this as like nonsense DNA. You just had all this kind of scrambledy gobbledygook in your DNA. Um, but the more we've been able to look at it, there are several types of non-coding DNA. And it's not that they're non-functional, they just don't code for proteins. All right, so we've got several types of non-coding DNA, which we will now list. So there is non-coding DNA within genes that gets removed from a transcript to make mRNA. We already talked about these. What is that called? What gets spliced out of mRNA before it gets turned into a protein? So yeah, so we have spliceosomes that remove what from our mRNA, right? Eukaryotic mRNA has to be like processed, right? Before it gets translated into protein. We've got to cut something out. So before translation, we cut out what? Starts with an I. And then we use the thing that starts with an E. Yep. It does start with I N. <laughs> Zoom folks, help us out. What do we splice out of mRNA before we translate it into a protein? Starts with an I. So we got pre-mRNA, we put caps on both ends, and then we use splice. Not yet. We use spliceosomes to cut out these little, it's a little bitty word, it's not even a big word, just a little word. Introns. Yep, introns. We cut out introns. Introns are non-coding pieces of DNA that are removed from mRNA, and that is a fourth of your genome, is just introns. All right, then we have structural, structural DNA. So, right, we talked about um, telomeres, right, the ends of DNA, which is super repetitive and it's just there to protect your chromosomes, right? And then around, right, remember, centromeres and kinetochores and stuff, right, that's all kind of around, it's on top of the DNA. And so that DNA doesn't get translated or transcribed either. It's structural, so it's super condensed. It's just there to kind of hold all of the chromosome stuff together, right? So we've got the structural DNA at the centromeres and then at the telomeres that are this, just there to kind of hold the chromosome together, basically, and help it go through mitosis and meiosis, all right? So we've got introns, we've got structural DNA, and then we've got simple se sequence repeats. Re holy moly, simple sequence repeats, SSRs right? 
And we kind of talked about these. These are just little two to three base repeats. They don't mean anything, right? But they're these little like, like ACG, ACG, ACG repeated thousands of times, likely due to replication error, right? And this is about 3% of your genome. So this is like your cat sits on your keyboard functionally in the DNA, right? We've just got these long stretches of just this repeating nonsense, right? So that gives you another 3% of your non-coding DNA, these little simple sequence repeats. The machinery is not as tidy as you would expect. All right, here's a few more. Segmental duplications, right? And we kind of talked about this when we talked about kind of like these weird whole chromosome changes. And so we've got these identical blocks, right? 10 to 30,000 nucleotides long that just kind of get like picked up and copied in different pieces. So you might have a couple chunks of this, like two 30,000 base pair chunks on the same chromosome or even different chromosomes, right? Where they've just kind of gotten shuffled around and copied for, for no good reason. They don't have a function that we know of, but just these segmental duplications where some piece has been copied more than once for some reason, and then it's just kind of ended up in a few places. Just kind of taking up space, really. This one's fun, pseudogenes. Pseudogenes used to be genes. They ain't no more. They've lost function for some reason. So they're like broken genes. So one of the way that happens, right, are mutations, right? If you have one of those nonsense mutations that stuffs a stop code on in the middle of a gene, it's busted. It's not gonna work anymore. It's not gonna get used, right? But it just hangs around. The thing is your DNA is kind of like, I don't know, like a binder that you just never take paper out of. Like you just keep shoving more stuff in it and you never clean it out, right? So your DNA is kind of like this. You've got these pseudogenes floating around that got like mutated and busted, or you also have pseudogenes in your nucleus because occasionally, for some weird reason, remember we've got mitochondrial DNA that's like doing its own thing. One of the things it occasionally does is escape your mitochondria and sneak into your nucleus. It's not gonna do anything there. It's not made to function there, but it just kind of hangs out, gets copied, gets passed on. It doesn't do anything. It's just there. And then these weirdos, transposable elements, blow my mind a little bit. So these are DNA segments. They may code, they may not. So they're one of the kinds of non-coding things. They are capable of just popping out of a chromosome and going somewhere else to some other chromosome. They can just shuffle themselves around your genome. 45% of your genome is not necessarily coding, but can just kind of get up and move when it feels like. What? What? It doesn't even make sense. But it happens. It's happening to you right now. Oh. Right? So we've got transposable elements. Okay. So we've got, what is that? Like six kinds of non-coding DNA. That's not, that's not the worst list. We'll add two more. That's eight. That's still, that's, you've got more fingers than that. So I think it's still fine. MicroRNA genes. What, what are those? So these make little pieces of mRNA that just never get translated. It's just like they get transcribed and then they like just bop off. They don't do anything. Um, sometimes they kind of do these epigenetic jobs. So maybe this mRNA gets transcribed. It's not gonna get made into a protein, but it can bind onto other mRNA, maybe turn mRNA that your body shouldn't be using off, right? It can kind of intercede and stop you from making proteins you don't need. So it can have kind of a regulatory purpose, right? Even though it never actually gets made into a protein. And then we have long non-coding RNA recently discovered. So this is one we're still learning more about it, but it's thought that it is also still involved somehow in gene regulation, this kind of after mRNA gets made, you've got other pieces of RNA that might kind of make something get expressed more and make something get expressed less depending on what your cells are needing in that moment. But we haven't known about it for very long so we're still trying to kind of figure out what this long non-coding RNA is for. Okay, cool. Whew. So we can sequence a genome, lots of genomes. We can compare genomes, we can annotate genomes, right? So, Got this beautiful sequenced 
annotated genome, what can I do? We can do comparative and functional genomics to learn about genomes. Just keep saying the word genome, right? So comparative and functional genomics, comparative genomics, right? So now we have, we have genomes everywhere, so many genomes. So you can use what I know about one genome, right? I can compare it to another genome and then figure out how that genome is working, right? Because they're going to share, if I know what genes are in this and what they're doing, and I find the same things in this genome, right? They're like, oh, well, this genome has the same genes doing the same things. So it's, it's literally just what it says. Comparative genomics is comparing genomes to learn stuff, right? So one aspect of this, right? Again, going back to cancer research, 60% of the genes involved in human cancer, right, that we've identified, those kind of over 200 genes, 60% of them are found in a fruit fly, which is handy because it is much easier to do research on a fruit fly than a human, really frowned upon research on humans for the most part, right? But this means we can study the behavior of these genes, these cancer-causing mutations in fruit flies, right? The mechanics are same, the cells are working basically the same, Right? So it allows us to use these model organisms to learn things about kind of human medical conditions and human biology, right? Because we can kind of compare between the genomes and see how things are functioning, right? We can compare entire genomes, right? An entire wheat genome to an entire corn genome to an entire rice genome because of the pro the blah, blah, blah. Nope, I've lost the word. By taking advantage of syntony, property of syntony. There we go, I'm losing my words. Syntony, right, just means that, so if you're looking at genomes in a bunch of, say different species, but things that are kind of closely related, the genes will still be basically in the same order, right? So the gene for this biological pathway will be probably on chromosome two here and probably on chromosome two in this organism over here. There tends to be kind of a correlation roughly between organisms, especially ones that are closely related as far as the order of genes and segments of DNA. So we can identify these using physical mapping, right? I'm interested in this gene on this chromosome in this organism, I can mark it, I can make it fluoresce. I can then try and mark the same gene, right? Have a fluorescent marker that will mark the same gene in another organism and then see if they show up in the same place, right? You can use those physical mapping methods. Or I can take some organism that we don't have a sequence genome for and compare it to some organism for one that we do, because then I can use the sequenced organism like as a reference point to kind of figure out what I have in my organism that does not have a sequence genome. So grains are one where this sort of research has been done. So it's a bunch of funny looking bars. We have the rice genome, we have sequenced it, we know everything that's in it, right? So these kind of little colored bars are indicating that like, right here's rice, it's got 12 chromosomes and we know and have annotated exactly what is on each of these 12 chromosomes. Cool. So I can then sequence, get some sequences say for sugar cane and I can take it and blast it, right? Compare it to this rice genome. I'm like, oh, this piece is right here. And like this piece is for some bizarre reason here, here, and here, fine, this piece is here, right? You go through and you compare them, right? So they did it for sugarcane, for corn, for wheat. You'll notice that wheat is a lot of just gray. We have no idea what's in there because wheat is just problematic. But because I know what's in rice, I can at least find some of them like, oh, here's genes we know what they do. Here's some genes we know what they do. They correspond. So on this chromosome one, it looks like this chromosome five, you can do all that kind of stuff, right? And you can even just kind of lay them all out next to each other. And so what you find, for example, if you look at, so in rice, this is, oh, this is, it's purple. So it's like chromosome five and like, I can't see colors, 11, right? And so in rice and sugarcane and corn, right? And even weirdo wheat, right? These genes still kind of end up relatively close together in when you take kind of the sequence as a whole. Right? And so you see this correspondence, right? We've got this genome that we know, and we can start lining up sequences and compare them. And we find these patterns, these correlations. They don't match up exactly, right? You've got some weird spots where things get a little funny. Wheat always just kind of messes everything up because it's extra weird, right? 
but they're correlated. And so you can say things then about organisms that you don't have a full genome for because you can at least compare it to one which you do have a genome for. So we have functional genomics. We can compare genomes, that's cool. But the other thing we can do is look at the function of genes and their products, right? We share all these genes, we can look at kind of how the genes occur in different organisms, but we can then look at how the genes actually function, how they actually get used in an organism, right? And so this is pulling like all the way back around, right, where we started with Mendel, this relationship specifically between genotype and phenotype right? The genes I have and the organism I become, right? One determines the other, right? Your phenotype is determined by your express expression of genes and then the interaction of you and the environment, right? That's also going to have some effect on your ultimate phenotype. Yeah. And so we can do this at this kind of whole organism level, but we can also kind of look at it on a smaller scale. We can look at expression in a healthy cell and compare it to a disease cell, right? And then we learn what genes are involved in causing some disease or some dysfunction, right? So we can look at how genes are functioning and what that causes, right? In the whole organism or in some portion of an organism. Okay. So functional genomics can kind of be broken into three major categories. So I can look at in a genome, all the RNA molecules that that genome produces. We've actually said this word already. What is that? All the RNA molecules that a genome produces. What's the other word? Do we have another word for RNA molecules? mRNA, what do we call them? It starts with the... So it's mRNA, it's messenger RNA. And we can also call messenger RNA, it starts with a T. Yeah, Tra yeah. transcripts. Right? So I can study all the transcripts in a genome. That's its transcriptome. We're really creative with these words. So there was a stage in biology where we just added ohm to absolutely every word we had functionally. We can study all the proteins in a genome. That's going to be its So we're studying all the proteins. So that's gonna be it's, all the transcripts of the transcriptome. All the proteins are the, mm -hmm. proteome, yep. And then we can study, and then we just kind of break our pattern. We can study the interactions and the products made by different genes between different proteins, right? So this is kind of full functional comparative genomics. Right. But we can look at the transcriptome, we can look at the proteome, which are both kind of products of your whole genome. Right. Okie dokie. So proteomics, studying your proteome, all the proteins that your DNA can make, right? Proteomics, studying the proteome. And this is a really dynamic sort of science, right? Because we know mRNA can be kind of alternatively spliced. So any given gene can make multiple proteins. So you can be observing a cell and look at what's being expressed, but it depends on what that cell is thinking is important at that point in time, because it's going to use that mRNA for some purpose. And you may not see everything, right? That that protein can, or that that gene can be spliced into. You won't necessarily see all the proteins at any given point in time. It depends on what the cell is working on at the moment. And so different sets of proteins exist, this makes sense, in different cells that are doing different jobs at different times in the life cycle of some organism. And so your genes, each gene can code for lots of proteins. And then once that gene makes that protein, right, remember your cells also modify proteins, add other bits and bobs onto them after the fact. So proteomics is actually kind of this crazy, highly dynamic, super kind of complex sort of field of study. Um, but it's kind of cool anyway. So looking at all the protein in an organism and trying to figure out all the different kinds of proteins and modifications of those proteins that some organism can make, right? Oh, yeah. So understanding protein function requires knowing about protein structure, right? Protein function determines protein structure. So starter primary structure. What is the primary structure of a protein? All the way back to chapter three. 
Yep, the order of amino acids in the protein. Yeah, the amino acids are, yeah, are the monomers of a protein polymer. And then the actual physical structure, the actual folding and shape, secondary through quaternary structure of that protein. Okay, let's see if this goes to... Cool, right, fabulous. We will start Friday at bioinformatics. That's a good spot to kind of break off. So we will finish up 18 on Friday, have a little time to review for Monday, test on Monday review on Wednesday. We're on the downhill.